Welcome to the Monocle Podcast. We are an independent management consulting firm, and in this podcast, we discuss our latest insights and opinions to help you achieve exceptional performance in banking and insurance together. Welcome to the Monocle Insights Podcast. I'm Guy Wilding, Research Lead at Monocle. And the predictive and classification powers of mathematical modeling are an established and essential part of modern day banking. And uh, naturally, model risk management has become equally as important. And so with the release of the Prudential Regulation Authority's latest supervisory statement on model risk management uh, in May this year, UK banks are now facing enhanced pressure to ensure model risk is managed effectively and sustainably. Uh, And what makes this even more interesting and more important is that financial service firms are embracing uh, the application of artificial intelligence and specifically machine learning uh, as a part of their modeling arsenal. So on today's episode, we're joined by Laura Jane Loraison, uh, Senior Manager at Monocle UK, to discuss the implications of the statement for UK banks uh, and what it takes to bolster their model risk management capabilities, as well as Kritzinger DeVette, Manager at Monocle, uh, who's going to give us some insights into what the future of model risk management looks like uh, with the use of machine learning growing. So uh, Laura Jane, Kritzinger, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Guy. Monocle recently released an insights paper on navigating through the latest statements uh, and the various challenges posed across model risk management principles. Uh, what does the statement mean for banks in the UK and what are some of the biggest updates? Uh, yeah, so I think I, probably one of the biggest updates is the introduction of this intentionally broadened model definition, uh, which actually will force banks to expand their understanding of what constitutes a model within their business. Um, I think this will mean that anything from a simple additive calculation to your highly complex statistical models will be considered a model under this updated definition. Um, With the tight deadline of 17th of May, 2024, this places immense pressure on banks, not only to carry out this manually intensive task of identifying and inventorizing, as well as tiering this widened scope of models, but it will also require them to assess and ensure that the existing framework meets the standards set out in the statement. And in terms of the standard or in terms of the statement, uh, is it more of a, a complete overhaul or is it something that's looking to kind of boost what's already existing uh, in model risk uh, in the UK? So I think within banks, um, they will already have a set uh, model risk management framework in place. Uh, so I think the standard is really just raising the bar and rather than reinventing the wheel. And, and you mentioned um, how scope is going to start increasing uh, because of the, the broad definition of, of what actually is a model in these banks. And we saw a statistic recently come out that large firms can see their inventories increase just organically or naturally uh, 25% a year. So without the, the model definition increasing from the, the statement or the standard, we're going to see these inventories increase by themselves anyway. So the challenge is really ensuring kind of a practical and manageable scope like you had alluded to. Uh, and you also mentioned the importance of a model tiering framework. So what is it uh, that is so important about tiering your models? And what are some of the factors that you're going to need to consider when you're applying a, a risk tiering framework? So I think having a sound and well thought out model tiering framework is essential for banks, um, as this will ensure that they're placing emphasis and prioritization on the correct models where the greatest business impact will be felt. From this, Monocle believes that a combination of using a scorecard as well as a decision tree is so important as it considers both your qualitative and your quantitative measures. And it also allows for banks to include considerations for their particular core business functions and how their businesses run. I think in terms of key considerations that banks will need to consider when building this tiering framework, we would need to consider things such as the models bearing on material business decisions within the bank. Uh, You'll also need to consider things such as your model complexity, the model's intended use, how well understood and documented these models are within the organization, just to name a few. As these will obviously have a significant impact on the risk associated to the models in the bank. Yeah, I mean, we've seen a significant uh, development in modeling as well uh, around the use of artificial intelligence. And so 
uh, besides just the statement coming from uh, from regulators in, in the UK, we've seen a survey conducted by the Bank of England and the Financial Conduct Authority, specifically on machine learning in the financial services industry of the UK from last year. And they found that over 70% of financial services, uh, or financial service firms are using machine learning applications uh, in one way or another. Uh, and specifically in banking, they found that risk management and compliance uh, had the second highest number of use cases um, that coming off the uh, customer engagement. So it's clear that machine learning is becoming a significant part of, of bank modeling, uh, and that has its own uh, model risk elements as well. So, so Chris, I'm going to bring you in uh, here. With artificial intelligence being such a broad field, uh, Chris, maybe you can give us a definition of what it is and what machine learning is as well. Yeah, sure. So um, I always like to think about it in this, this fashion. Artificial intelligence is sort of the top umbrella. Uh, and then within that sits machine learning. And machine learning is just a form of artificial intelligence that makes use of quantitative models to extract a pattern from the underlying data uh, and then make predictions, recommendations, and decisions uh, based on the patterns that it sees. And we typically refer to three types, first being supervised learning, and that is where your data is labeled. So you've got a, you know, a target, something that you are trying to predict. Then we've got the unsupervised uh, machine learning, and that's where you don't have any labeled data. Um, and so this is typically where your clustering algorithms and the like come in. Um, and then a third one called reinforcement learning. And so in this scenario, some of your data is labeled uh, and the algorithm sort of picks that up and, and learns from it, but then some of it is not labeled. And as this machine learning model uh, goes forward into time, it starts to label this, this data as it learns the, the, the patterns. Uh, and as a data scientist and, and having been involved in that part of the industry, uh, what have been some of the recent events in AI and artificial intelligence that has accelerated its adoption in the industry? Yeah, thanks, Kai. I think it's important to note that the financial services industry is a highly regulated environment um, that faces a lot of challenges with regards to data privacy and, and um, security. I think these challenges have um, definitely shaped the adoption and deployment of AI within the banks. Um, that being said, I think the, bank, the banks definitely you know, realize the immense value that these applications hold. Um, thinking about like the, you know, the sort of the buzzword now going around large language models that uh, really got popularized by OpenAI's ChatGPT. Um, I mean, they've got applications ranging from, you know, auto code completion for software developers all the way to like a personalized customer experience for the bank's clients uh, by way of chatbots. And so I think for the bank, they definitely see the, the value in it. I mean, with the same number of uh, employees or resources, they can essentially punch above their weight now. And I think as long as that, that balance, um, you know, is in play, that it'll only accelerate the, the rate of adoption. Looking at the statements as well, and just looking at, at banking risk, we, you know, we see a lot of application around credit, market, operational risk, being those big risk types for banks. Uh, where have you seen machine learning being applied in amongst those big risk types? Yeah, so... Guy, I think if we if we take credit as an example, you know, if you take a credit application, it's something that's pretty standardized, um, but it takes analysts quite a bit of time to put to, together, uh, go through all the, you know, the, the reports and documentation and then summarize that uh, together with the financials. And so I think that's a, a key area where something like a large language model could quickly come into play. Um, you know, it's able to put some structure around that uh, and quickly summarize and, and put together what what you would would have to do for a, a credit application, you know, something as simple as, as a credit application could be pre-populated and a credit analyst could just, you know, have a quick look at it, see if they agree, it ticks all the boxes um, and then remove a big part of the work. Yeah, that's great. And I mean, if we look back at the statement, uh, what we see is that there's no explicit mention of artificial intelligence or machine learning. Laura Jane, coming back to what you mentioned, the principles are there and they are broad but they're open enough to include these new technologies and these new techniques. Uh, and so, Lajan, you mentioned model risk tiering being a big part of it and, and looking at factors like interpretability, explainability, data bias. You know, these are all challenges that we see coming out of the space of artificial intelligence and, and machine learning. And so one of the statements from the PRA is that they expect higher model risk for more complex models that are difficult to understand and explain in non-technical terms. And that sounds to me like uh, neural networks and those sort of things that are 
extremely technical and are going to require more allocation of controls and validation, uh, specifically around those those models or those types of models. So Kritzinger, just uh, continuing that, and, and again, from your experience as a data scientist, what are some of the risks or issues that come uh, with banks looking to employ machine learning? Uh, and what are some of the issues in the model risk space as well? Yeah, guys, so there's a, a popular quote going around saying that, you know, um, all models are wrong. It's just that some are useful. And so whenever you, you, you know, you model something, um, you must know that there is an associated risk with it. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It, it uh, depends on how you manage and, and, and monitor that risk um, that then ultimately mitigates it. But thinking on, on the, the machine learning side of things, things we often see in practice is something like simple overfitting of a model where a model is trained almost too well on the training data. When that model is then met with uh, new or unseen data, it then um, you know, performs worse than what you would expect. Um, leading to incorrect predictions. And if there, if there are decisions that are based on those predictions, um, you know, there could be financial losses or rep reputational damages, um, things like that. Another thing we often see is data quality and bias issues. So um, if the underlying data has got a, you know, a, a, a bias, um, the model would then perpetuate that bias, um, also leading to incorrect predictions in the, in the long run. Um, another thing we often see is concept drift, whereby, you know, you build a model, things are looking great, it's, it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, and then let's say there's a change in the business, you know, with regards to a sales process or whatever it might be, that over time, your underlying distribution of your data starts to change. And if we don't keep good track of that model, it could not factor in this change in, in the distribution and then ultimately uh, predict, you know, erratically. Before the podcast, we were talking a little bit about uh, the status quo, and, and we'd spoken about how machine learning is sort of is a new area uh, of expertise in the bank. How do model validators and, and managers who are approving models feel about the use of uh, machine learning compared to uh, techniques that they're more that are more kind of established and comfortable in the banks? Yeah, so I think there's a, a couple of schools of thoughts. Um, so it would depend on who the, the line manager is almost. Um, if that's a person that is quite comfortable with some of the, call it newer techniques and so, um, I think they'd be inclined to, to go for it. But f from my experience, at least, they'll always go for the more conservative approach. And also think that's the more prudent approach. Uh, make sure that you fully understand why a model is acting the way that it's doing. Uh, ensure you've got your guardrails up. I think that's the best approach. So, so Laura you've worked directly in setting out Monocle's approach to the statement uh, for our clients, uh, as well as just model risk management in general. What is Monocle's recommended approach to complying with the higher standards of the latest statement? And, and how does Monocle assist our banking clients? I think, Guy, this would largely depend on how far along uh, the banks are with their MRM journey. I think with a, with a tight deadline in place, Monocle believes that it's essential to arrive at a point within the organization where a model level gap analysis can be performed. Our preferred approach would be to have two work streams running in parallel. Uh, one which would focus on defining, inventorizing and tiering your models within the bank, similar to what I discussed earlier. And then second to that would be focusing on refining and assessing your existing framework um, alongside the statements itself and the standards set out there. Once you've had these two work streams running together, what you would then be able to do is perform this model level gap analysis to identify where there are any gaps within your existing models. And this would set the foundation for being able to draft a remediation plan or a roadmap to ensure that models can be brought up to the standard where any gaps have been identified. And the deadlines for the statement? So the statement is due by the 17th of May, 2024. And that, yeah, that includes the the streams that you mentioned and having that remediation plan for, for that time. So not a lot of time left. Um, if you think about it, we're almost at the end of the year for uh, for banks in the UK to to get cracky on that. So yeah, definitely an exciting uh, space to be in. Uh, and Kritzinger, what are some of the machine learning projects uh, that Monocle has uh, been involved in? Yeah, so over the years, we've been involved in a number of projects uh, at some of the leading banks and, and insurers. Uh, and it's ranged from um, modeling some of the operational risks that the banks and the insurance might face, uh, things like fraud compliance, anti-money laundering. Um, so it really depends uh, from client to client. That being said, I think the, bank, the banks definitely, you know, realize the immense value that these applications hold. 
I mean, with the same number of uh, employees or resources, they can essentially punch above their weight now. Yeah, I mean, with the, the PRA highlighting how model risk has become a traditional risk type in its own, uh, and, and with the development of AI and machine learning, uh, we're definitely going to be seeing uh, this space evolve and in some cases become more complex, you know, especially when we look at applications around uh, credit risk, scenario modeling and operational risk. And so I think conversations like these looking at both the regulation changes uh, and, and the changes of technology and techniques in the industry is, is really valuable. Uh, Laura Jane Kritzinger, thank you guys for, for making the time, um, coming on the podcast and sharing your insights. Thanks so much for having us, Guy. Thank you, Guy. So for our listeners who would like to learn more about what we do at Monocle, you can find all our insights on our website, including our latest uh, model risk management paper, Navigating uh, the Supervisory Statements, SS123. Similarly, if you'd like to contact us, you can find all our details on our website for our United Kingdom, European and South African practices. Visit monoclesolutions.com to subscribe for updates. From Johannesburg to London, Cape Town to Amsterdam, Monocle, we manifest change.